Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC here in the studios. We got Alejandro Moreno, Stevie Nichols, Sebastian Salazar. We'll also be joined early on here by Stuart Robson on what is Cup Final Weekend across Europe, Germany, England, Spain, and France. Let's begin with the FA Cup Final. Chelsea and Arsenal. There you see the SPI giving Chelsea 62% odds. Now, the SPI does not take into account injuries. We know Laurent Koscielny uh, suspended, Gabriel injured, Mustafi still a question mark, so some really big issues at the back for Arsenal. Stuart, let's start with you on this one. What's the best plan of attack if there is one here for Arsene Wenger and company? If he's got enough fit players to play a back three, I think he'll play with a back three. I think he'll try and match up with Chelsea's shape. He would try and stop uh, uh, the wide centre-halves coming out with the ball. He'd match up 2v2 in the middle. And he hoped that his wing-backs stop Chelsea's wing-backs. But he needs three centre-halves. And I'm not sure he's got three centre-halves at the moment. Monreal could play as one of the centre-halves, as he has been doing, holding the other. And it's, up, it's between Mertesacker and Mustafi, who plays that third centre-half. And Kieran Gibbs will be the left wing-back, if he's fit as well. So that's the best way for Arsenal to go. Match up against Chelsea and try and play them at their own game. All right, gentlemen, a back three. Is that the... Easy solution. <laughs> well, uh, see, I appreciate what Stuart is getting at, and, and I understand where he's coming from with this, but if you're going to match up Chelsea at what they do best and what they have been so successful doing throughout the course of the season, then good luck with that because they're better at doing that than you are as Arsenal. It's not natural for Arsenal to try to match up the way that, that Stuart is talking about. It may be the best chance that they have of winning the game, because defensively, they just simply don't have the numbers. But I just don't see a scenario in which Arsenal is better playing with three in the back than Chelsea would be better in that same system. I don't see how they can even contemplate playing with three in the back. Uh, it's something that you have to spend time on. Uh, and with so many players missing, it's impossible that they're going to have any cohesion. In my opinion, Asim Wenger has to go against everything that he believes in. And he has to make sure they are tight as a drum. Because if they play three, they get ripped apart. If they play open, they'll get ripped apart. But Asim Wenger has never shown us he's willing to do that. He has to do it, otherwise this game will be over pretty quick. Stuart, we've gotten the opinion of the guys here in studio on this, but Arsene Wenger claims mm. that regardless of what happens in the FA Cup final, it won't impact his decision at Arsenal. Are you buying that? Uh, first of all, let me say that he's played with a back three. Eight out of the oh, nine, the last nine games, he's won eight out of the last nine games playing with a back three. Is this going to be his last game as, as Arsenal manager? I don't think it's going to be the case. I think he'll stay on. There's question marks now. I think the board is starting to question him. Even Gazidas is talking about a director of football, which Arsene Wenger only two weeks ago said he didn't know what a director of football did, so he was almost going against the board there. But he's changed his tune slightly. Before, he was saying it was his decision. Now he's saying his, his future will be decided after the FA Cup final. And I think that might be by the board. If they win the cup final, I think he'll stay in a job. If he doesn't win the cup final, the pressure on him will be immense. Guys, you agree? What I agree with is the idea of the board making the decision rather than Arsene Wenger making the decision. As accomplished as he has been a, uh, as a manager for Arsenal, there comes a point where somebody above Arsene Wenger has to have the vision of what is the, in the best interest of Arsenal going forward. Not a sentimental decision, but an objective decision. Where is this club going and is Arsene Wenger the best person to lead this, this club forward? I don't think that that's the case. But the board has to be objective and they have to have the power to make that decision. We are of the thought and the idea that maybe Wenger decides when he comes and when he goes. At some point, the leadership of Arsenal has to show up and say, we make the decisions and we are ready to move on. Do you suppose there's some negotiating here, you know, backroom changes, sporting director? Could Arsene Wenger work with that pressure? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's about the pressure. If, if he is forced into having less say in matters, how does that leave him? How does he feel? When you've been in charge of every single thing at a football mm. club and all of a sudden they start taking strength away from you... That's the beginning of the end, right? There. That's the beginning <laughs> of the end, absolutely. I mean, I've always thought he'll stay because I thought he was the one that had the choice. If he doesn't have the choice and he start pulling, pulling his strengths away, I think he may not be there. Stuart, what do you think about this? 
Well, the problem is, whatever they do, if, if Arsenal decide to sack Arsene Wenger, they've left it far too late. We've been talking about this for now about four or five months, where Arsene Wenger said, first of all, it was his decision, and he'll let us know when, when he felt like it. Now he's also suggesting that the board might make the decision. If they go and sack him, or, or, he, or he leaves, where are they going to find the next manager from? They're going to have to do it very quickly. The next manager who comes in has got to have his own sort of players to come in, so the transfer kitty may be changed, and the people they're looking at will be changed suddenly. He'll have to look at the players... That that they've got, the ones they're trying to sign, like Sanchez, like Ozil, will they want to keep Ozil, the new manager? Will they want to keep some of the other players that I think have been at the club far too long and not doing the job particularly well? So it's a massive change they're going to make, and they've left it far too late. Arsene Wenger should have been sacked or, or, or left his post a couple of years ago, and they should have been building up to it f at the year beforehand. At the moment, they don't know who the next manager's going to be, and the next manager that comes in will have absolutely no chance at Arsenal, because the philosophy, the mentality is all wrong. You know that Stewie secretly doesn't want Arsene Wenger sacked, right? Because he, he won't give him, he, will, he won't have anything to talk about if he's gone. Uh, one end of the coaching spectrum, Arsene Wenger. At the other, Antonio Conte, looking for a double in his first season in charge of Chelsea. Stewart, coming right back out to you on this. Antonio Conte, historic in so many ways, but what an incredible debut campaign mm. in the Premier League for the Italian manager. And we shouldn't be surprised, really. For three years, he was magnificent for Juventus. He wasn't so good in the Champions League form, but in, uh, in, the, in Serie A, they were absolutely brilliant. They played good football. You could see what they were trying to do. You could see their philosophy. You could see their patterns of play. When he was with Italy in the European Championship, we saw that performance against Spain where he totally masterminded a, a brilliant tactical display. And after changing to a back three with Chelsea after, uh, after four or five games win, he's always played with a back three. They have been absolutely magnificent. He's managed the players well. He's managed the tactics well. And also he's managed the, the hierarchy well. Guys, considering where Chelsea was a year ago, I mean, an FA Cup final here puts the icing on a pretty impressive cake for Conte, doesn't it? Yeah, and we're talking about a team that, as you just alluded to, was floundering last season. And, they, and it was essentially the same group of players, uh, give or take a few, clear and goal. Kante has made a difference to this team, and there are a couple of players that have added something to Chelsea. But the key players in this group, Eden Hazard, who was uh, underwhelming, to say the very least, uh, under Jose Mourinho at this time last season, you look at a team that reacted and bought into the idea of Antonio Conte. But in order to do that, you have to have a manager that is infectious, a manager that brings a different energy, that brings a different uh, optimistic attitude about work, about grinding results, about tactical awareness, discipline, all these things that we like to speak of in sort of general terms. But with Chelsea, you see it specifically being uh, executed properly on the field. All right, we're less than 24 hours out now. Let's get some predictions. Stevie, start with you. Seriously? I mean, we got to. Chelsea. <laughs> how does Arsenal win this game? I don't know how to do it. Give us a score. Give us a score. 3-0, Chelsea. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to make an argument for Arsenal here. We, they have their defensive problems. Kosielny is not there. They have holes everywhere. And you just match them up, man for man, against Chelsea, and I'll take Chelsea's players. In the end, it has to be Chelsea the winner. Stuart, your prediction? You can only see Chelsea winning the game unless Sanchez has the game of his life and Petr Cech makes 10 or 11 good saves. It's going to be Chelsea, I think. Thank you very much, Stuart. All right, here's the SPI. We mentioned Cup Final weekend across Europe for the German Cup Final between Eintracht Frankfurt and Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund looking to avoid a fourth straight defeat in the German Cup Final. And we'll be discussing that match and much more on the next edition of ESPN FC. For to find us, check your local listings. Silly season cometh when we return the latest transfer rumors, including the latest on Alvaro Morata. Stay with us. The exit door wide open at oh. Manchester City. As so we see all those headed towards the end of their time with Manchester City. Jesus Navas, Gael Clichy, Bakari Sanya, Willy Caballero, and Pablo Zavaleta, just to name a few. Gab, that means there's obviously space on the roster for more additions. Bernardo Silva now set to come over from Monaco. What can you tell us about that deal? Uh, well, he flew into Manchester, and uh, the indications are that uh, it, it, it's all very close to being done. Uh, I think, obviously, we're all familiar with the player. 
uh, he does seem to be a little bit in the mold of, uh, of some of the guys already there, and I think offers a pretty cool, a pretty important indication of, uh, of, of how Pep Guardiola wants to, wants to play going forward. Guys, I've seen some criticism of this move, that it's kind of a luxury move from Pep Guardiola. you agree with that? I think what it refers to is what also Gab mentioned there, is that there seems to be a lot of players that would be kind of like Bernardo Silva. And, and so where do you play him? And that's the real question. Leroy Sainz seems to be a guy that will have, has gotten a hold of that left-sided position. Then you have David Silva, Kevin De Bruyne, who has become more of a central player. So is Bernardo Silva the guy who's going to give you speed on the right-hand side? That's not what he does best. Do you sacrifice Raheem Sterling? What happens with Ilha Igundohan when he comes back? There's a lot of questions here about players that are very similar in terms of what the role that they would play. You're not going to get rid of Gabriel Jesus because certainly that's a guy that promises a lot of things in the future for Manchester City. And if you keep Sergio Aguero, I don't know that there is enough space for Bernardo Silva. Do you like a move, Stevie? Absolutely. The guy's a player. Yeah. He's 22 years old. And he's, he's already at a level that he's touching, touching world class. I mean, if, if I'm anybody at City, if anybody's worried, it should be Raheem Sterling. Because for me, yep. Silva, no question, can come off that right-hand side now. And in a couple of years, when David Silva's not probably going to be up to it, he'll slip back inside into the middle of the park. So I think this is a fantastic signing, and he's a fantastic player. And if indeed it is Raheem Sterling who sacrificed and Bernardo Silva comes on the inside to combine, then Guardiola has to find a right back that has that willingness to be an outlet down the right-hand side, as we have seen Dani Alves have been that for Barcelona and Juventus, a player of that sort of type, and, and that can give you an attacking option down the right-hand side. Mm. Yeah, we saw the list at the very top of the segment. Uh, five or six players already set to go. So who else is Manchester City looking at? Well, I think the answer in some ways is, is in the list. I mean, when it comes to fullbacks other than uh, uh, Kolarov, who, of course, saw a lot of time at center back this season, uh, they don't really have any left. So uh, you definitely need uh, one, probably two right backs. Uh, and you probably need one, possibly two left backs. Uh, I think goalkeeper-wise, obviously Joe Hart uh, will probably be coming back from his loan uh, from Torino, but uh, it's by no means uh, certain that, that he's going to stay or indeed that, that Bravo has the job again next season. Uh, and then I think uh, they'll need help in, in central midfield. Yaya, of course, um, on his way as well. Uh, and even then they could probably do with another defensive specialist. And, uh, and I... Not 100% sure that Sergio Aguero's uh, future is totally resolved either. Um, some suggestions that, you know, for the right price, uh, they may let him go and, and find somebody else who, who might fit what Pep wants better. Uh, also, strong suggestions that uh, Kelechi Ihanacho uh, could be going possibly on loan or, or possibly a sale with a buyback option. Yeah, let's stick on the transfer front here. It seems like there's more smoke with Alvaro Morata potentially going to AC Milan. Will this eventually end in fire and him heading to a return in Italy? Yeah, I don't know about this. I mean, some outlets are reporting that, uh, you know, they had agreed a deal in principle um, with Morata. But, you know, first of all, technically they're not supposed to be talking to him because he's under contract with Real Madrid and has a pretty uh, big game uh, coming up uh, uh, on, on June 3rd. But uh, beyond that, I think this is just simply the sum that they'd be willing to pay him should he come. Uh, Alvaro Morata is getting married on June 24th. Uh, his, uh, his, his fiance, of course, is Italian. Uh, they're getting married in, in Venice, incidentally, in the Lido. Cristiano Ronaldo will be in attendance, as will, will Gerard Pique. Um, but that to one side. I think this is just kind of Morata's people sending a message to Real Madrid saying, hey, look, this is what another club is willing to offer us. Uh, he had a tremendous season this year in, in limited action. Uh, you know, can we maybe get a little more respect uh, and get assurances maybe in terms of playing time uh, as an alternative to Karim Benzema? Uh, to sign Morata, I think you're talking uh, somewhere north of 60, 70 million. That seems like a lot of money to spend, even for Milan's new owners, who obviously want to make a splash. All right, thanks then, Gav, for all the latest transfer news. Now and throughout the summer, head over to ESPNFC.com. Still one match to be played in Syria as Juventus steam towards a sixth straight title. Something to be cited there at second place, though, Roma and Napoli. Roma right now 
with a one-point edge, and both will play on Sunday. Gab Marcotti, what should we be looking for in the final weekend of the Serie A season? Well, obviously, Juventus have uh, wrapped everything up, uh, so uh, the spotlight pretty much falls on Roma and Francesco Totti, who will be playing his uh, his final game after a lifetime at Roma. It incidentally, he came out with a statement today saying that uh, he was uh, uh, that this was his last game for Roma, but not necessarily his final game ever. Uh, even though, of course, he is 41 years old, uh, so. Uh, there's some suggestions that you know maybe he'd be looking for new adventures elsewhere, uh, China, Middle East, MLS. All this stuff has been mentioned. My guess is he's going to stay put, but hey, you never know. Guys, no chance. What? What? Whatever happened to club loyalty? <laughs> I mean, he's no Roma through and through. He's born in Rome. Played there since he saw the debut in 1993. It seems you're going to stay there till you're 41, and then go and play <laughs> yeah. for somebody else. Right. I don't right. think so. Yeah, it's uh, it would seem to be a surprise, no, Ale? <laughs> I don't see it happening. Uh, look, you, you've come this far. You, you, might, yeah. you might as well just go out with Roma. And, and he's had a tremendous career. I, I just don't know that we ever saw Totti in the stage that we would have liked to have seen him with more consistency because the success with Rome was not necessarily what you would have or what you could have gotten from him if perhaps he had gone and played for a bigger team. So that, while I admire his loyalty to the club... I also would have wished to have seen him playing with bigger clubs. Stevie, in modern football, can you imagine a guy staying with one club as Tati has for, you know, 20-some-odd years? Uh, no, it seems... It, the thought seems uh, an impossible one now. Um, players pretty much moving on every three or four years. Uh, the money... Uh, loyalty is... Loyalty... is not something that you can buy... It's, it's something that you have inside of you. And there aren't many players that have that inside of them, certainly nowadays. Gab, real quick uh, on Roma, Luciano Spalletti, their manager, has been linked to Inter. Is that something we think we'll see get done in the next couple of weeks? Well, it, Inter certainly, um, they, they're, they're casting a very, very wide net. They, they, they've been chasing uh, everybody from Conte to Simeone to Laurent Blanc. Uh, Spalletti's fallen in there. Spalletti is the big bonus, of course, of being available because uh, he's most likely going to leave Roma uh, in a few days. So, um, you know, I think he's there. He's willing to talk to them. He's going to want assurances of, uh, in terms of how the club's going to be run. Inter needing all the help they can get right now. Seventh heading into the final. Who's the replacement if he does leave Roma? Uh, Roma have kept that pretty close to their chest thus far. Um, you know, certainly uh, there's an ambitious project there. They brought in Monchi from Sevilla to be the director of football. Some people are saying that that's the smartest signing they've made in some time. So, um, you know, he's getting on with it, and uh, we'll see. Welcome back to the show, Gab. It's been a difficult week for European stars and their issues with the taxman. What can you tell us about the latest with Cristiano Ronaldo, who's now been implicated? Well, uh, prosecutors in uh, in Spain have been looking in uh, some of the uh, Ronaldo's tax situation, especially following uh, the revelations uh, uh, from the so-called uh, uh, football leaks uh, leak earlier uh, earlier this year. Uh, suggestions that Cristiano Ronaldo and Jose Mourinho, in fact, used a, a complicated web of offshore companies to minimize their tax burden. Uh, you might have seen headlines that they're talking about, you know, possibly a five-year prison term. Uh, the interesting thing here, though, is all of this is, is, is premature uh, at this stage because he hasn't even been charged yet. He's simply been investigated and the investigation's over, and now it's going to be up to the prosecutor to decide whether they charge him. Um, but what is, uh, what is remarkable here, though, is that we're talking about $15 million, uh, in allegedly evaded taxes. Uh, and if you use a sliding scale and compare it to Messi, with Messi, it was $4.1 million, and he got a 21-month uh, prison sentence, which he's not going to serve because it's less than two years. But that key is those two years. Uh, should be, Ronaldo be uh, charged? Should he be prosecuted? Should he be found guilty? Should he get a sentence of more than two years? Then you could, be, then you could start talking jail time. But you know what? That day is far, far away. For now, he has not even been charged, and it's, uh, it's important, I think, to bear that in mind. Juventus, Real Madrid, what's your itch as we get into the final week here of preparations? 
Well, I think a lot's going to depend on uh, on what condition some of the guys who some of the injured guys are going to be in going into the game. Uh, obviously, you're talking about people like like Danny Carvajal, like uh, like Sammy Kadir on the other side who are coming back into it. Uh, I would assume that they're going to be uh, fit somehow. Possibly Gareth Bale too. Uh, but the reality is, you know, we just don't we just don't know at this stage, and I think that's going to uh, really affect. Uh, how, how how this game pans out and, and how the two coaches prepare. Ale, you'll be in Cardiff. Do you have starting to lean one way or the other here? Oh, I've been leaning all the way over to Juventus the whole time. I look at Juventus and their balance is far superior to that of Real Madrid. Individually, Real Madrid, I think, is more talented than Juventus. But overall, the work of the group defensively by Juventus, not only out of, their, out, of their, out of their defenders, but out of the midfield, even the guys up top, how they're able to get behind the ball, make it very difficult to break down, but they also have the talent that when they win the ball, they're able to go on the attack, and they have enough talented players in that attack and have that they can create problems of their own. That in itself, that combination, I think, will be enough for Juventus. I don't disagree with you on Juve, but it's kind of wild to think of Real Madrid as an underdog in any match. Well, it is, but I think that tells you more about Juventus and Real Madrid. I think Juventus, for me, are, are the team in form. Uh, they're the team that I think has no flaws. Uh, where Real Madrid's flaw is uh, defensively, and that's pretty much why I'm going to go for Juventus. Juventus and Real Madrid. You think by, by, by the way, flawed defensively. And I don't, I don't, and I don't yeah. think, I don't think that Real Madrid comes into this as underdogs. I, 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 Real Madrid in a final is not an underdog. Underdog's the wrong word. Well, he used it. I'm pointing the finger at me. <laughs> Put the blame that on the guy. host. That's the best <laughs> way to do it. We'll see you next time on ESPN FC. All right, we've made it to extra time here on the show. Alejandro Moreno, Stevie Nichols, Sebastian Salazar, Gab Marcotti standing by. Hashtag FC Extra Time if you want to get involved. Let's go out to Gab for the first one. This one coming in from Joey. Gab, who is the best European team to not win a trophy this season? Wow. Uh, mm. I feel like I need time to prepare for that. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Barcelona do have a cup final coming up, so I might come out and say Tottenham, but uh, I don't know. I stand to be corrected. I'm sure somebody's going to come up with, uh, with somebody, some, somebody better, but for the time being, I, I suggest Tottenham over the likes of, uh, of Napoli and uh, Atletico Madrid. Spurs sounds like a pretty good candidate. No. Yeah, but I'll go with one of the teams that he mentioned there, Atletico Madrid, and uh, a team that started off slowly during the season. They got better, they improved, they had a different identity about the group, but uh, still closed the season out very strong and made a run at Champions League. Roma? Will they mention Roma? Mm -hmm. huh? On mention. the day, on the day, it could be anybody. Another one here from uh, DVA18. What would be the best destination for Wayne Rooney? I guess we're all assuming his time at Manchester United has come to an end. Major League Soccer. You think so? Yep. Well, why are you so surprised? Is, uh, is this well, a fake surprise or are you no, really no, no. surprised? No, I, I'm genuinely surprised. Not so much because I don't think Wayne Rooney might not want to come here. I just don't know that an MLS team will be willing to pay him what he expects to be. Paid. Well, That's but, my surprise. Well, maybe, maybe mm. there's something to be said that Wayne Rooney is maybe going after a lifestyle. <laughs> A lifestyle choice. Have you seen some of the money that some of the players are earning in MLS? Yeah. Who have but not done an awful lot yeah, in football terms. Wayne Rooney's on the back end. I don't know that MLS teams are trying to do that anymore. No, well, no, yeah, but, but, but he's, I think he's, he's on, uh, on the very short list of players that you can still get something out of. And, uh, what and what have, he's got between his ears, yeah. more than would make up for what he's lost in his legs in MLS. No question. Yeah, have you got a vibe on where uh, Wayne Rooney might end up? You know what? He has two years left on his contract. Uh, he earns right around $16, 17000000 million uh, a year, maybe a tiny bit more. Uh, I, I don't know who's going to pay that money. So I think the key thing is if Wayne Rooney wants to move from uh, United, uh, he's going to have to take a pay cut. And that's if he stays here in England or if he goes to MLS or elsewhere. I, I just don't see anybody ponying up that kind of money, except possibly China, but those thoughts have, have filled up pretty fast. The reason I mention MLS right off the bat is because 
it, it, it is a lifestyle choice. The fact that he can walk the streets here in the United States and there won't be the sort of pressure and hounding pressure that would be in a place like England or in, even China. He'll blend in in the United States. And, and it's something entirely, totally different as to what he has experienced over the course of his career. And maybe a change in that lifestyle may be something good for Wayne Rooney and his family. Is there a team that you think makes sense? Oh my goodness, you just went from, you just went from, <laughs> from you just went from MLS, what? No, MLS? Uh -huh. To now asking me well, what I'm, team? I'm asking you if there's a team that makes sense. Well, let's You seem it. very confident that it's, a, that it's an op opportunity for him. So what team is the team? Well, if he's willing to take this pay cut that Gab is talking about, and this is indeed just a lifestyle choice, then you start thinking, well, what are the teams that could actually afford this? And so the New York teams come up. The L.A. teams come up. Those are the logical choices. I don't see Wayne Rooney going to Columbus. I don't see Wayne Rooney going to Salt Lake. And I love me some Columbus. But that's, that's where I play. No, I don't think Wayne Rooney's going to go to middle America. Come on now, you, you, know, you, you know the answers to these questions. Come on. Yeah, I mean, You've been a, around MLS. There's a few other big spenders, but yeah, you, you pretty much covered them. All right, Sanjay, uh, worst Risky. transfer of the last year. Stevie? Well, I think it has to be Janssen. It spoils. Mm. You buy a centre forward, you buy a striker, you think you're buying goals, and what did he give you? One. Not goals. <laughs> no, he did. He did. He got one. He got one at the end of the season because, ironically, all the fans went mental. Well, everyone got because one at the he end actually of the for Spurs. because he actually scored the goal. I mean, I'll go with got to be Jansen with Claudio Bravo, and and I know many levels because you you moved an important part of your team off to Torino as if he was just some other guy. So Joe Hart gets moved all over the place. You bring Claudio Bravo, and you say, you know what? This is my guy. And Pep Guardiola was steadfast, stubborn. This is my guy. This is my guy. This is my guy. Until he wasn't, because he was awful. It has to be the worst. Gab, worst transfer the last year? I'm going to go with uh, another Spurs player, but I'm not that I'm picking on oh. them. Uh, but I I'm going to go with Sissoko. Sissoko. And, and the reason is it's not that Sissoko's <laughs> terrible. Uh, it's, the it's the way this whole thing unfolded. When you sign a guy in the last hours of the transfer window, you end up overpaying. It's a messy transfer. He was going to Everton, and he turns around, he comes there. It's pretty obvious early on he didn't really fit into anything that Pochettino wanted to do, even after when, when Lamela was hurt, when Dembele was out. No matter who, who was hurt, this guy you know, really struggled to get any kind of regular start. When he got on the pitch, he wasn't good. And on top of that, you look at his age, look at his contract, you know, they'll be able to, to, to find some other uh, uh, sucker to go and take Jansen. But I think Sissoko, uh, unless they want to eat a lot of his salary, they're going to be stuck with for a while. All right, thanks very much, Gab, Brale, Stevie. I'm Sebastian. That's all the time we've got. You can catch us Sunday, midnight Eastern time, 9 p.m. Pacific, ESPN FC on ESPN2.